Hey everybody, before we get started, just a reminder to please subscribe to my channel. I need all the subscriptions that I can get. If you like this video, you're going to like all the videos that I've done so far. So please subscribe to the channel and be sure to listen to my podcast. It's called Photobomb. It's available anywhere that podcasts are found. We've been doing this podcast for five years now. Me and Gary Hughes, we talk about all of the uh, latest photography news that's going on that week. And we also talk about our own lives and our experience as professional uh, photographers. And we have a lot of fun doing it. I guarantee you, if you like these videos, you will love the Photobomb podcast. And join my group on Facebook. It is called Pro Photo Talk with Boo Ray Perry. And it's a great group and lots of great people in there. Now, if you go down into the description right below here, you will find a link that will take you to my website. And on there, you will have links to the podcast. You will have links to the Facebook group. You will have every single piece of gear that I carry, both professionally and when I'm on vacation, the stuff that I carry with my Fuji X100F. Everything is listed on my website. And if you click on any of those links and go buy them from Amazon, I get a little bit of bit piece of money of that. And it helps to keep this whole thing going. So please uh, feel free to use those links uh, when you go shopping on Amazon.com. All right, so this is a big video, and I've been I've been thinking about this video for a few days now. Uh, as those of you know who have been watching the channel for a while, I have been seriously thinking about switching from Canon to Fuji. I currently use a Canon 5D Mark III for my professional work. I shoot primarily weddings, uh, beach weddings, and beach portraits, and headshots. I do everything, but I'm kind of known for doing a lot of weddings, a lot of weddings on the beach. Uh, I use a Canon 5D Mark III. I've been using it now for almost 10 years. I love that camera. It's been very, very good to me and does incredible work for me. But I bought the Fuji X-T. Oh, not the X-T. I'm sorry. The Fuji X-100F. I bought that camera, I guess, uh, four years ago. I bought the previous model of this camera just to use as a walk-around camera uh, to use on vacation, and I fell in love with it. I just love this camera. It's a joy in the hand. It is a joy to shoot with. It makes you want to pick it up, and it makes you want to shoot. And this started me flirting with the idea of actually maybe switching to Fuji for all of my gear. And I've done a video about this. If you look, I believe it should be right about here, right up here. I'll have a link, which is a video where I discuss in detail my thoughts on whether I should switch to mirrorless, when I should switch to mirrorless, and which one I should switch to. So go check that video out. We're not going to talk about that today. What we're going to talk about today is the fact that I actually got my hands on a Fuji X-T3. So it was sent to me. A friend of mine loaned it to me. And with the big uh, 70 to 200 millimeter equivalent f2.8 lens. And I have been using this camera this week professionally to, you know, run it through its course and find out if it really can do the job that my 5D Mark III has been doing for me for so long and doing so well. And the reason that I was doing this is that my 70 to 200 millimeter lens for my 5D Mark III, my Canon lens, uh, the lens mount the screws came out of the lens mount and I sent it off to Canon Professional Services to have them fix it and they came back and said that they don't service that lens anymore uh, and even if they had the parts they said we wouldn't service that lens anymore we don't service that lens anymore so I had to send it off to a local repair shop and I thought oh, while I was doing that if I have to replace this lens it's going to cost me fifteen hundred dollars two thousand dollars if I have to spend that much money I might as well go ahead and make the jump I might as well go ahead and switch to mirrorless. So that really got me to thinking about with, if, if I was going to make that jump, am I going to switch to Fuji or am I going to switch to Sony or am I going to wait and maybe switch to the new Canon when it comes out with two card slots? Because that's a deal killer for me. I can't have a card. I can't have a camera without two card slots and the Canon R only has one card slot. So I really started to think about it and then my friend loaned me the Fuji X-T3. Perfect. So now I get to spend a week or two shooting with the Fuji X-T3 and really get a feel for it. So here's what I discovered. And it's important to realize watching this video that all of my videos are personalized to me. If you're looking for a video that just breaks down pros and cons and what this camera does and what that camera does in a very non-objective way, then I am not the person for you and this is not the channel for you. I'm not a professional reviewer. I those videos are okay. They have their place. I watch them too. But what I really like is when a professional working photographer tells you his opinion. That's what I want to know. I want to know how you feel about something. Uh, so that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to talk about the Fuji X-T3, how I feel about it, what I feel it does good, what I feel it does bad, and ultimately why I have decided that I'm not going to switch to the Fuji X-T3. It, it's probably going to surprise you when I tell you why. Okay, so let's start off by talking about the biggest good, the thing that's, for many people, this is it. This is the deal killer, and, and that's going to be image quality. Perfectly happy with the image quality. Blown away by the image quality. 
perfectly fine with the uh, shallowness of the depth of field. I'll put another link right up here. Oh, sorry right up here because I did a video on how when you switch from a full frame camera to a crop sensor camera, your depth of field is going to change. And will that affect my work? Will I have a problem with it? I do not. I shot some images with a shallow depth of field with this camera and I was blown away. Love the image quality, love the shallow depth of field. No problem whatsoever using this camera as my full-time camera in that regard. Fantastic. Particularly love the simulations for film that Fuji has built in, the um, classic chrome, which mimics the look of classic Kodachrome film, is my favorite by far. <clears throat> I love this slight vintage look that you get on images that you shoot on the beach because to me that's you know, the classic film people on the beach. I, you know, I just it fits me, right? It's my style. I like it. So I just particularly love this to the point where if I were to switch to the Fuji XT3, I might would go to JPEG. I might would start stop shooting raw and just start shooting JPEG all the time because I really love the image quality. That being said, Canon has great image quality too. I don't have a problem with that either. You know what I'm saying? It's not like I need to get away from Canon because it's bad and now this is finally something that's good. No, they're both good, but uh, Fuji just does things differently and I really like the way that they do things. So that's a big plus for Fuji and I love the camera for that reason. Other things that I love about this camera, I love the retro look of the camera. I love the big dials on the camera. You will never find a camera that you can pick up and use so quickly and so easily having never held the camera before or having never read the manual. A perfect example of that is that I was shooting in an auto mode on the beach, right? I had my shutter speed in auto, I had my ISO in auto, and I was setting my aperture myself. And then I went to using off-camera flash, so I need, and so I was still trying to use the auto mode and I was using exposure compensation to just adjust what my background was going to look like and it wasn't doing what I wanted it to do. I, I don't remember exactly what it was, but I think the ISO wasn't staying where I wanted it to stay or something. I, I don't remember exactly what it was, but it wasn't doing exactly what I wanted it to do. And you know, my, my family is standing there waiting for me to take their picture. So it was no problem. I just immediately reached up to the dials on the top of the camera. I just reached up to the dials right here, bam, bam, set my ISO where I wanted it, bam, bam, set my shutter speed where I wanted it, set my aperture where I wanted it and went back to full manual very quickly, very easily, and was able to get the shot that I wanted. Love the manual controls, love the retro controls, love the way the camera looks, uh, love the fast focusing feature, love the eye focus, focusing worked just fine for me. When I got into a low light situation when the sun was going down, it wasn't finding eyes anymore, it was still finding the bodies, but it wasn't finding eyes, but there is a feature on the camera that I wasn't using. You can hit a button on the camera and have the camera basically not show you a real world preview, but instead lighten everything up, just like looking through a DSLR. Had I used that button, I'm sure it would have found the eye. Uh, many times shooting uh, the individual close-up portraits, it was great to just have that eye tracking jump to the eye right of way. I loved it. And of course, there are people who will compare that to Sony and say that Sony is faster. It may be faster, but if you're coming from a DSLR like I am, <laughs> it's still a miracle. You know, I mean, a Ferrari is faster than a Corvette, but if you've been driving a Pinto, the Corvette is still plenty fast. Right? So, so that's kind of the situation with the Fuji. I think you're kind of, you know, splitting hairs when you worry about the speed at this point. It's fast enough, is what I'm saying. Uh, there was some stuff that I read online about the Fuji X-T3 and specifically the files that maybe dive deep into the sharpening and processing hole on these files. Mostly they talk about there being some worms uh, little worms. If you get in real close and you look and you do the pixel peeping, you will find some worms. Well, I did that and I saw what they were talking about. But you have to blow the picture up to 100% or 200% in order to see that. When, when do your clients ever see pictures at 200%? Who's looking at this besides other photographers? And when my pictures go into 8x10s, they might go into wall art. Uh, and if that's the case, you're not going to see it there. You're not going to see it on a print, right? And you're not going to see it in a photo album. So when people start talking about the worms, I, you listen, when I look at it on my screen, my big screen, it looks fantastic. My clients will look at it and they will think it looks fantastic. I think you're really, you're really starting to dive into a, a deep rabbit hole when you start talking about that stuff like that. All that really matters is when you look at that image, how do you feel about it? Is it good? Is it beautiful? Do you really, really like it? And I, I love the images on the Fuji X-T3. Uh, the body is uh, weather protected. That's good. It doesn't have in-body stabilization, but listen, 
you, you're not going to get in-body image stabilization. If they put that into the Fuji X-T3, there'd be nothing left for them to put into the Fuji X-H2 when it comes out in a year. They have to save something for the X-H2. And this camera is $1,500 brand new. You're not going to get everything in it. You're not going to get the stuff that you get in a $3,000 camera. Of course not. I'm okay. My current camera doesn't have in-body image stabilization. I've never had a problem with that. You know, so for $1,500, i am fine. If I was spending $3,000, well, then I would expect some IBIS. But no, for $1,500, part of the reason that you buy the Fuji X-T3 is because it is so uh, less expensive. Build quality on the camera is fantastic. Uh, build quality on the lenses is fantastic. I just, you know, I love so much about this camera. One of the things uh, that I would have to do if I switched to the Fuji X-T3 is I would have to get a new spider holster mount. There's my spider holster mount on my DSLR. You can't put this on the Fuji because it will block the battery door. And believe me, you've got to be able to get into the battery door because you're going to be changing batteries a lot. So um, that, you know, that's $100 maybe expense. That's not a big deal. And uh, I'm happy to do it. So that's kind of a thing that I wasn't really expecting. Um, weight. Hmm. Uh, let's talk about weight. So I weighed these cameras, I put them on the scale, and I checked out the weight. And when you look at the weight of the Fuji versus the Canon, the weight of the Canon body is 2.13. The weight of the Fuji body is 1.32. That's almost a pound. Almost a full pound less weight that you're carrying with the Fuji body. Now, I, and I only weighed the big lens because that's the one that really wears on you after a day of shooting a wedding. I weighed the big 24, I'm sorry, the big 70 to 200 millimeter equivalent with the Fuji and the 70 to 200 millimeter equivalent with the Canon. Those lens also, the Canon lens is 3.67, the Fuji lens is 2.38. So total, so total between the two lenses, with the lens and the body, with uh, no other mounts or anything on there, no flash or anything, you're talking about a difference of 37%. So using the Fuji with its big lens, 37% lighter than the Canon. Do you notice this? Well, yeah. You pick both cameras up, you notice it. When it's in your hand, yeah, you notice it. Maybe you don't notice it as much as you'd like to, but there's no doubt that this camera is lighter than the Canon, and it's smaller. The Canon body itself is larger. The Canon lens itself is small is larger. So yes, by switching to crop, you are definitely shaving a lot of weight and you are shaving a lot of size off of your camera. That being said, Canon's new R series, the next one that they come out with is due, I think next year, it might be phenomenal. But more importantly, Canon is coming out with a 70 to 200 millimeter lens for that camera that is only as big as a 24 to 70. To put that in perspective, they're coming out with a 70 to 200 millimeter lens that is the size of this. Right? I don't know how much it's going to weigh, and more importantly, I don't know how much it's going to cost. <laughs> I, I have a friend who thinks it's going to cost $3,000. Now, I would love to have a 70 to 200 millimeter lens that's that small, but $3,000? Please, Canon. Please, don't do that. Because... You're just gonna you're gonna price yourself so far out of the market for so many of us pros. Try and keep that lens down around two thousand. If you get less than two thousand, that'd be great. But of course, they won't because their current seventy two hundred millimeter lens is two thousand. So it's gonna be at least two thousand dollars versus this, which is thirteen hundred, fifteen hundred. I'm I'm not sure. So yeah, price huge factor. That's another big factor. If you go the XT three, wow, are you saving money? Your lenses are cheaper. Your camera body is cheaper you are really going to save money by going with the X-T3, and that's very attractive to me. I am a businessman, and the bottom line is important. So, a lot of great reasons, a lot of really great reasons to switch to the X-T3 from the Canon. But one big reason why I can't do it. And I expect that the comments will probably blow up a little bit, and people will say, this doesn't bother me at all. Maybe it doesn't bother you. Great. If it doesn't bother you, great but it bothers me and it's a deal killer and it's ergonomics. It's the grip, the grip. I can't get past the grip. Okay. Let's take a look at this. Here's the Canon. If you look at a Canon camera, if you look at a Nikon camera, if you look at Fuji's own top of the line camera, the X-H1, they all have the same sort of grip. It is a pistol grip and it has a trigger forward. You see what I'm saying? The trigger isn't back here. 
the trigger is forward so that when you hold the camera, you hold the camera in your hand, it falls right into your hand like a grip on a, on a pistol would fall, right? And then your finger naturally falls right there on the grip, right? That's where it falls. Now, let's look at the Fuji. With the Fuji, if you grab the grip the same way in a pistol configuration and hold it the same way, look at where your finger falls. Now, look at where the trigger is. Now, as I'm trying to do this, I am afraid I'm going to drop the camera because in order to, I can't even get to it. The only way I can get my finger to this trigger is to reorient the camera in my hand like this. So now, instead of holding it in a pistol grip, see, now I'm holding it diagonally across my palm. Here, I've got, as the, as the camera wants to rock back, let me turn this way, as the camera wants to rock back because of the heavy lens, it's rocking into the base of my palm. When you move your hand up here, it's rocking back right into the edge of your thumb, right here. Can you see that? Okay, so having to hold the camera like this puts all the torque and all the tension right here in this part of your hand. Whereas when you're using a pistol grip, all that tension goes down here into the lower part of the hand. And you have the whole hand ready to hold that camera. But when you turn it, the camera comes here and the camera is right on the edge of slipping out. So this is how I want to hold the camera. And this is how I have to hold the camera. And you can see, see how much of my palm is not being utilized to grip the camera when I switch? How it's right in this pocket here? And so as a result, when I hold the camera this way, these fingers right here are really, really taking the weight. They are, this is basically, everything's being held by these two fingers right here. And I'm really having to scrunch my hand up tight to make sure I don't drop it in order for me to get my finger on the trigger, right? Even if you put a grip on it, and I have the grip. So even if you put the grip on it like that, if you hold it pistol grip style, that's pretty good. But you can't because your finger won't reach the trigger. You've got to turn it. And now look, the pistol grip in the back. Here's your hand in the back, right? And when you turn, look, now this, this part of your hand right here is getting away. And, and now you're putting it into the thumb area here instead of it being locked in here. I hope you can see this good, right? This is huge. Also, when you put the pistol grip, the, the uh, grip on it, you make the uh, camera weigh almost as much as the Canon does. So you totally negate the whole fact that you're carrying a lighter camera, which is one of the reasons you want to switch. Now, there's another solution, and that solution is to put a grip on the camera that's not a battery grip. You can put a grip on the camera that's light, right? It's across the bottom. There's no, bad, there's no stuff down here, so you're not going to get any extra support for your hand. But it's deeper on the front. It comes out further. But listen, if I did that, th all that would do is bring my fingers even farther out. My fingers would be even farther out on the camera, right? It wouldn't help, which means it would be even harder for me to get back to the trigger. I would have to go even more. I would have to go like this. And you see? If take these fingers out, it does not help this finger get... It, taking these fingers out from the camera, look, does not help. It doesn't help me, right? I, I need... See? I actually want my fingers in close if I'm doing this. Take these fingers out, and, that, and now it's even more of a stretch. I want them in close. Yeah, this isn't a very scientific, uh, you know... <laughs> I know it's hard to do this on the video here, but... um. <sighs> It's a, it's a complete deal killer. Now, if I was a, a hobbyist, or if I was shooting on a tripod, or if I was only doing portraits and only held my camera for 30 minutes to an hour at a time, then this is a no-brainer. Absolutely. Love this camera. Love everything about it. Got to buy it. Great. Wow. Fantastic. But I carry my camera for seven, eight hours a day with a big lens on it. I've got to be able to rock solid hold on to this sucker. And having to hold it with it twisted in my hand like this, that is just not as good as holding it this way. There's a reason 
that every camera manufacturer puts a big pistol grip on their camera with a forward trigger because that is the most comfortable way to hold something. That's the reason that pistols are designed that way. That's why it's called a pistol grip, right? Boom, the trigger should be right here. This is where the trigger should be, not back here, here. And Fuji knows this. The Fuji X-H1, that's the way it's configured. So why are they doing it on this camera? Well, the only thing I can figure is, well, cost maybe? It must be cost must be a factor with that. But also maybe it's because they're trying to distinguish between the fact that the X-H1 and the soon to be released X-H2, hopefully, is supposed to be the big pro camera. Whereas the X-T3 is a camera that's what we call prosumer. You know, if you're a serious consumer, you can buy it. Or if you're a pro who wants to use it, you can. But it's not the pro camera. The pro camera is the X-H2. Or perhaps the, uh, the X-Pro. You know, the X-Pro 1, X-Pro 2. But it's disappointing because to love a camera so much and to have ergonomics be the reason that you can't buy it? Wow, right? You, you expect it to be something else. There's nothing else. There's, no, there's nothing else about this camera that is a drawback that would stop me from purchasing it. And there's so much about this camera that I love that makes me want to purchase it. Absolutely. But for a full-time wedding shooter holding his camera five, seven, eight hours a day, no. I'm sorry. Once you have used something with a pistol grip that you can hold on to and it really is supported in your hand and you really know it's not going to go anywhere, once you've held that, you cannot go to this sort of a grip because it's just it's just digging in right here. It's just digging right in. It's just digging because it's, instead of resting in my palm, it's just digging in right here. And I know after seven or eight hours, I would have a huge mark right there. It's a shame. So what does this mean going forward? Well, the Fuji X-H1. I'm not going to buy the Fuji X-H1 today because the focusing is not as good as the X-T3 and that's vital for me. And it doesn't have the latest uh, X-Trans processor, processor, of course. But the Fuji X-H2? Well, I don't know when that's coming out. Um, the original rumor was late this year or next year, but now they're starting to say it may be 2021 before we see that camera finally hit the market. Fuji, speed it up. Because if you could give me the Fuji X-T3 in a body that has a good pistol grip with a trigger forward, you've got my money. I'm absolutely making the jump to Fuji. So speed it up, especially because Canon is coming out with their new, what they say will be a 70 megapixel sensor, megapixel, mega, <laughs> a 70 megapixel sensor. They're supposed to be coming out with that next year in time for the Olympics. Okay, you need to get the X-H2 out. Because if they come out with that camera and it's awesome and they come out with that 7200 millimeter lens and it's short and it's in the right price point, it's going to be really hard for me not to stay with Canon. It's going to be really hard for me not to just buy an adapter and piecemeal switch over to the new system. Although it's not going to be really hard if Canon prices their stuff through the roof, which is what I'm really afraid is going to happen. I'm afraid that what's going to happen is that it's going to be $3,000 for that 7200 millimeter lens and it's going to be $4,000 for the camera body. If you can come out with the X-H2 and you can price that thing under $2,500 with the current lineup of lenses that you have, done, sold, take my money, I'm switching. But right now, you just don't have it. You don't have a camera with the ergonomics that are needed by a full-time wedding shooter who's not getting any younger and the quality and the image that is built into the X-T3. You've got the X-T3 and it is fantastic, but I've got to have a better grip. I've got to have that trigger move forward. It's not just a question of the grip. It's the trigger. Because I, you know what carpal tunnel, tunnel syndrome is? You know how you get it? You get it from repetitively moving your, stretching your fingers. Well, I'm sorry. That, that extra stretch right there over the course of 100 weddings, not going to be good. Not for me. You're a portrait shooter? Great. Wildlife? Great. Landscape? Great. Using a tripod? Great. All of these things. X-T3 is your camera. But for me personally... I can't get past that pistol grip. So there it is. There's my rundown. That's my shakeout of the X-T3. Fuji, I love you, and I love this camera, and I would love to switch to it, but I can't do it with the trigger in the position that it's in. Thanks for watching. Be sure and subscribe to the channel below. Be sure and go and check out my website, which has got everything on it, my podcast, it's got my Facebook page, and it's got all the gear that I carry and all the gear that I use. Thanks for watching, and 
Stay tuned. <laughs>